Uh, so, yep, uh, let's go ahead and get ready to kick this stream off. Of course, this is going to be PCI DIY Stream uh, 75, so excited about that. We've got a lot of different things to talk about for uh, this stream. We're going to be talking about a pretty, pretty cool giveaway that we've got going on with one of our Powered by Asus partners for a full gaming system. Uh, we've got brand new monitors to talk about, new motherboards to talk about. Uh, we've got a brand new UEFI feature on our Z790, Z790 series of motherboards uh, that we're going to be talking about. Uh, we've got some cool promotions going on, and of course, we're going to be answering your guys' uh, questions. So, uh, a lot of things to go ahead and dive into uh, feel free to go ahead and let me know what we got going on in terms of any questions or comments and I'll do my best to go ahead and jump when I can to those uh, in the stream there so let's see who we have uh, joining us here we've got a zoom in thanks so much for joining us here on the stream we've got RC cosplay joining us here on the stream thanks so much for also joining us we've got James joining us hey Erica fantastic as always thanks so much for joining us here on the stream uh, we've got uh, Looks like uh, Pidgey PCs also joining us here on the stream. We've got Samuel joining us from the stream, uh, Michael joining us, H2O Computers, uh, and of course, I'm sure quite a number of other people, including a tech. I don't know if I've ever just seen tech before, but uh, I like your little uh, your little icon right there. It looks like a Ryogen 2 cooler, so pretty cool. So uh, let's get ready to go ahead and jump into it. We're going to go straight into news of the day. So let's get ready to go ahead and just uh, talk about some of the cool things right off the bat. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and just quickly get out of the way the UEFI BIOS announcement. So in terms of the UEFI BIOS, uh, for those of you not aware, essentially that's the firmware for the motherboard. Uh, every week we try to give you a consolidated recap of all the UEFI releases that we've had for both Intel and AMD based motherboards. If you're not aware, make sure to go ahead and join us in terms of our ASUS PCDIY group. It's a fantastic community that we have online where actually I go ahead and post the actual full change log in terms of all the models that we have expected. So uh, if we go ahead and quickly actually take a look here, let me go ahead and just show you what this would look like. And I'll drop the link in the chat. You can also also find this actually in the description if you're checking us checking us out take for instance on YouTube uh, but here if we go ahead and take a look at our PC DIY group you'll see that there's a featured post announcement right here uh, it actually breaks down to you uh, a couple of insights in terms of recommendations in terms of should you update the UEFI should you not update the UEFI different things you want to keep in mind and then all the way at the bottom you'll actually see a full list for AMD and for Intel based motherboards so I'm going to go ahead and drop this in the chat but the specific kind of focus that we want to jump into for this week in terms of the UEFI BIOS it's going to be for these Z790 series of motherboards. This is the brand new, pretty much the second big formal release that we've had since the launch of Z790 series. Uh, this just continues to overall improve interoperability, compatibility, and performance, but it also introduces a brand new feature. So let me go ahead and first uh, copy this into the chat for you guys if you guys are interested in checking that out. And again, of course, if you're not, make sure to consider joining us in our group, okay? So this is the full update list that you have available. Um, now, what have we gone ahead and introduced for this generation? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at it. So uh, some of you may not be aware that essentially there is a couple of different options that are available within the UEFI BIOS. And when we take a look inside of the UEFI BIOS, you essentially have these uh, options, which actually relate to essentially how the uh, Intel CPU essentially boosts in terms of its overall boosting behavior. So traditionally, you had essentially had this auto optimize option, then you would have disable, which would be in Force all limits, which would generally be a little bit more constrained, still essentially give you full stock performance, but it would also limit a little bit of kind of the maximum thermal kind of output of the CPU. So essentially it would run a bit cooler. Uh, then we would have re remove all limits, which generally would offer the highest level of performance, but also produce the most heat. Now, this is generally not of any consequence. If you're a gamer, if you're a general desktop user, you don't need to worry about this. Uh, but you might have seen maybe some media that would say that a 1300 series, or even actually in the prior generation, 1200 series, they said was kind of a hot CPU. Um, in my estimation, actually, I don't think that's accurate. You can go back and watch our 12th gen and 13th gen live streams and actually real time overclocking. And I did it both on air coolers and on AIO coolers. When you talk about gaming workloads and general desktop workloads, uh, temperatures are actually very easy to handle with a high performing tower heat sink or 240 or 280 or 360 millimeter AIO. But for a select number of users that really just for whatever reason want to stress test their system with a synthetic workload, even though it's something they're never going to run into, or maybe if you're a user that does run a heavy workload. And what I mean by heavy workload means that using all the cores on your system, then you can definitely actually producing significantly more heat. And in that regard, some users maybe don't want to necessarily get up to that potential, maybe around 100 degrees uh, that the CPU can get under, under that heavy workload. So we've gone ahead and introduced this new multi-core enhancement 90C mode, which will essentially offset, it'll reduce a little bit of the performance by a very minor degree. It's very minimal. It's still actually really higher performing than the stock uh, 
uh, stock enforce all limits, um, but you'll generally see that the actual reduction from about that 100C is going to come down to about 90C, so it'll about to be a 10C drop. Now keep in mind that when we talk about temperatures, a lot of people just want to talk one target temperature, but the reality it's quite a bit more complex than that. Temperatures actually exist across all of your cores, right? And so you can actually commonly have a what's called core to core delta, where one core can actually be running hotter and one core can be running cooler. So in some situations, you actually might even see more than this 10C, but this is the approximate delta, about a 10C arc. So um, once you go ahead and update to this UEFI BIOS that we've gone ahead and released, the 700 series, you will see this new multi-core enhancement option. So let me go ahead and uh, just compare this for you kind of side by side so you can see uh, what this looks like. Uh, just, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I pretty much just showed you the option right there. But um, let me go ahead and I think I can show you side by side here just for kind of for reference. Yeah, here we go. So, and in a moment, if anybody has any questions, I, I will go into the, the, the chat and just double check to see if you got any questions on that guard. So just give me a little bit of time to finish kind of just going over this. So just give me a second right here. So uh, right here, this is going to be the legacy uh, UEFI. So this would be the essentially the older UEFI if you were running it. And then you would have the updated UEFI. So you can see right there in the older UEFI, you have auto, disabled, and enabled. And then under the new UEFI here, you would have auto disabled, enabled, and then enabled, but enabled with the 90C target. And pretty much all you have to do is just select the 90C target and you're good to go. Um, it's very, very, very simple. Again, in the PCDIY group, I have gone ahead and covered this a little bit more um, kind of in line, but let's go ahead and take a look essentially at kind of what you could expect uh, from just the very basic level in terms of kind of the performance limits. So we're gonna go ahead and check that out. So let's go ahead and do this one. And we'll look at these kind of two here. So here we go. Okay, so yeah, I have the two results right here. So this should be remove all limits. And so right here, if we take a look, uh, we're running, of course, Cinebench right here. And this is on the Maximus Z790 Hero. And if we take a look right under this peak, uh, we can see that we're getting just at about around almost 100 degrees, right? So you can see that's the overall temperature, right? Now keep in mind that's not necessarily all the cores. You can see some of the cores are actually, as I noted, you have a core-to-core -core delta, and that's entirely normal in terms of seeing a core-to-core -core delta, right? Uh, but you can overall see that 98, 90, 87, 88, 96, 92, 98, right? So we can overall get um, essentially a reference of that type of load. Now, again, if you're running gaming desktop usage, this is not going to be the temperatures you're going to see. Literally, you would be seeing a significantly lower uh, temperature. Uh, and it actually wouldn't be common to probably see maybe see these temperatures for normal gaming workloads, probably being around the mid 50s to about mid 60s. So maybe rare game scenarios, maybe they could be in uh, the 70s or so. Um, of course, this is also influenced by your ambient temperature and by your airflow, your chassis. Uh, but now let's go ahead and take a look at the new 90C option. And so you can see right here that in the 90C option, Right there, you can see 91, 84, 82, 84, 91. So we pretty much have significantly reduced that temperature by a noticeable uptick. Now keep in mind, a lot of people will swap out like the thermal compound, try to change out fans. Most of the time, just changing out thermal compound, even from a really good thermal compound to let's say the absolute best is probably only gonna net you somewhere between about maybe two to four C. Um, so it's very minimal. Fans somewhere can be in the range of sometimes uh, I'd say about maybe two to about six C. So this is actually probably greater than almost the change that you would have from probably generally most fans and from thermal compound, even if you can kind of combine them together. So it is a noticeable reduction in terms of that overall temperature. And when we take a look at the actual score, um, keep in mind there's run to run variance. And so what I mean by that is if you just run the benchmark multiple times, you're gonna see a little bit of difference between the two, right? But you can see right here, 39,532. And then here, if we go back, uh, 39,927. So we're pretty much still in that relative ballpark of what you would be expecting in terms of overall performance. So overall, a very cool feature that we've gone ahead and introduced for this generation uh, for our Z790 series of motherboards. So overall, pretty cool. Uh, feature. So if you're interested in checking it out, again, just feel free to go ahead and jump, uh, join into the ASUS PCDIY group. Uh, there's a full featured post on it. All the motherboards are noted there and you're pretty much good to go. Um, Angel's asking, please explain how to get the maximum RAM installed on a single computer. So I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the maximum RAM. Uh, that's actually really dependent on your motherboard and by your CPU. Your CPU has generally a 
what's called a memory controller and it has a kind of a certified amount for most modern platforms in terms of memory you're generally talking between 128 to maybe 256 gigabytes of memory but most systems are generally going to be validated for uh, that configuration although for most gamers generally really it's hard pressed to say that you really need more than 16 gigs enthusiasts sometimes run 32 or even 64 gigabytes um, so uh, you know, in terms of just installing the max memory, it's pretty simple. Just buy the kit of memory that you're looking for. The only thing to keep in mind always is that keep in mind that higher densities of memory, especially if they're overclocked or more stressful, they're a lower likelihood to be successful in terms of running those configurations. So if you really need a lot of memory, you're uh, generally um, best off to go with what's called a lower rated speed, a lower divided to ensure stability. But if you have more questions on that, uh, feel free to go ahead and post a question in our PCDIY group, okay? All right. Um, let me just go ahead and just see. Oh, so uh, you actually posted a follow-up comment there. I need a computer with more than 120 gigabytes of RAM, but the biggest is three by uh, 32 by four. And actually, that's not the case. You can get actually 64 gig DIMMs. Uh, they just tends to happen more in the professional market. If you really need really much more than 128 gigabytes, you're going to need to look at HEDT platforms uh, or DDR5. DDR5 in the future will even support higher densities uh, that will be available. You're just starting to now uh, get ready to probably start seeing 64 gigabyte kits uh, that'll be available, or excuse me, 64 gigabyte DIMMs. Um, and this is already being developed for the server market, uh, but keep in mind, these are gonna be significantly more expensive. So it's generally easier to go eight DIMMs if you're talking about cost, um, but you're not gonna be looking at the current modern platforms. You're gonna be looking at an HDT platform. So something like Threadripper uh, would be an example. And there you have have eight slots that you have available if you really did need more than 128 gigabytes of memory okay all right um so that pretty much wraps up our ubfi bios uh update for this week again really really cool feature uh that we have now introduced here with the new 90c mode um again and this is only going to be available i know some people have asked hey jj is this going to be available on other um asus motherboards no this is just for 700 series so z790 so you won't see this on uh, beasts like b660 series motherboards even though they can support 12th or 13th gen and this won't be on z690 based motherboards so it's only applicable for z790 based motherboards okay um, and you do want to go ahead and update that now uh, the last thing I want to go ahead and touch on is just something that some people have asked questions about that I've seen some kind of um, just kind of back and forth regarding Z690 and 13th Gen series CPU support. So keep in mind that all Z690 series motherboards already support 13th Gen series CPUs. And a lot of users will just say, just update the UEFI BIOS. But that's not actually correct. If you go back and take a look at our guidance that we've issued, um, you actually need to do two things specifically. You have to update the UEFI BIOS and you critically have to update the MEI firmware. So that's the management engine firmware. There's actually a separate executable that you do need to download and run and update the MEI firmware. If you want to ensure the overall uh, best interoperability, compatibility, and performance for the system, this is not optional. It is a requirement that you need to make sure happens. So I wanna go ahead and just show you which file this would be. Again, this is only gonna be if those of you are gonna be considering running Z690 and maybe upgrading to a 13th gen series CPU. So as a reference right here, we've gone and checked out our motherboard. This is the ROG Maximus Z690 Hero. You would hover to the drivers and tools, and then you would go to BIOS and firmware. Now you can see right here, we already have essentially a formal UEFI release that states supports four 13th gen series CPUs. But if we actually scroll a little bit further down, we're going to keep scrolling down and you see that there's actually a firmware that was issued for the audio controller. But then right here, this one right here, this Intel MEI, this one is the important one. So you actually have to run this MEI firmware tool, and then you do want to optimally align that with the latest MEI driver. Okay, so essentially three things. You want to make sure to update uh, the UEFI BIOS, right? Then you also want to update the MEI firmware, and then you also want to update the MEI driver, okay? And uh, let me go ahead and just show you, if you always want to confirm the MEI driver, um, then you can go ahead and do that again within the UEFI BIOS. So I think I have them right here. Yeah, go ahead and open this up for you and I'll show you right here. Okay, yep. 
<clears throat> so here, if you actually open up the motherboard page, you'll actually see that there's a little MEI firmware version. So like here, you could see this was like 16.0.15, So this is the older MEI firmware. And then again, here is 16.1.25.18.85, right? And so uh, you want to make sure to have that MEI firmware completed, okay? So then again, that's just a little bit of kind of a, a sidebar piece. It's not generally kind of UEFI BIOS based, but since it's kind of linked together, for those of you that may be considering 13th gen series, do keep Keep that in mind as well okay um, and critically the MEI firmware cannot generally be done sometimes the UEFI BIOS will complete the uh, firmware updating during the actual UEFI update but in some situations right now you do have to run the MEI firmware within the OS environment so that means that it's very important that sequentially you can't essentially kind of try to do this after the fact you actually need to make sure to be in an OS environment and then run the uh, the MEI firmware updater okay All right, um, so let me go ahead and just double check and see here if we got any other uh, questions that might have come up there quickly. <clears throat> uh, Rick says, which one do you run first? Uh, you would wanna actually do the UEFI BIOS first. Um, that would be my recommendation. And then you would do the MEI firmware. So if you, let's say, had like a 12600K and you wanted to update to like a 13600K, most people don't do this. But if you wanted to for some reason, then I would recommend doing the UEFI first and then doing the MEI and always ensure a full reboot between each one of these processes. Okay. Uh, somebody saying, Simon, can I use the top M.2 slot? Yes, uh, of course. You can pretty much always use the top slot on most of pretty much the Z790 motherboards because there's always one PCIe lane that is going to be reserved uh, from the actual 16 lanes. That's part of Intel's uh, essentially PCIe lane um, essentially layout, right? And so that is something that's flexible. Um, but you always have to look at the manual. The manual will help you understand in terms of the way that breaks down. Stardust asks, does the MEI firmware update the driver as well? No, that's a separate driver. So then that would be under the drivers tab. So we were under the uh, BIOS and firmware tab. So then you click back over to the drivers tab, which has like all your drivers, like your chipset driver, your sound driver, your network driver, all the drivers for your motherboard. And that will contain the actual MEI firmware driver. Okay. All right. All right, so I think that goes ahead and covers that. If anybody has any other questions on that, feel free and go ahead and let me know, and I will do my best to go ahead and get to that when I can. Um, next up, we're going to go ahead and be talking about some of the new products, but before I do that, I want to go ahead and shout out a pretty cool little giveaway that we have going on with one of our uh, PBA partners. So if you guys are not familiar, our PBA partners are essentially our Powered by ASUS partners. So these are our essentially system integrators that we work with. Um, they essentially carry ASUS components, and then they bring their experience or expertise and their professionalism to be able to offer your pre-built. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I know many of our people, of course, in our PCDIY group love to build their own systems, but if maybe you want to start off with, um, you know, a system that's already been pre-built for you and then upgrade with it or work with it from there, there's definitely nothing wrong with that. And of course, there's definitely that nice assurance that you get everything that's kind of working well, right? Um, and one of the cool things about the PBA partners as opposed to, let's say, like a more OEM type system is that these are essentially using DIY components. So they're pretty much the same components that you would use when you go about building a system, right? And so our friends over at uh, Velstorm have gone ahead and put together a full giveaway. So let's go ahead and actually take a look at this giveaway right here and see what we got going on for it. Uh, this is actually the cool little system that I had in the little preview image right there. Um, and it's pretty high end. It's I think it's valued for about like $5,000. So it's pretty sweet. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at it right here. I think I have images for it. <laughs> Let me go ahead and see if I, if I have those images here. Oh, did I? Oh, hold on, guys. Let me actually load this up here. I think I have them right here. Okay. Oh, yep, here we go. All right, perfect. All right, so this is actually the system right here. It's a pretty cool system. We actually uh, showed off this system at our actual PC DIY day uh, uh, last week. And so you can actually see right here, it's got a custom painted chassis. I can see a really nice Tough Gaming graphics card. They've gone ahead and mounted it vertically. We've got a uh, Fractal Designs chassis in here, right? We've got some cool, of course, ARGB cables that in there. It's got a Ryogen cooler in there. We'll go through all the specifications, but this definitely is a top performing, pretty much flagship gaming class system. So again, um, very, very nice system in terms of its overall core specifications. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the specs. Um, 
We also go ahead and take a little bit of this angled shot right here, which shows you the inside. You're even going to have this cool little customization that they added in there with the secondary stat panel. Um, and you can see that's got that beautiful ROG baseboard in there and even a Ryogen 2 360. So pretty much the same cooler you see here right next to me. So this is going to be limited to the United States. So if you guys are checking us out from, of course, the great up north in Canada, or you're checking us out from some other other part of the world, sorry, this is not a giveaway for you. But as always, just make sure and follow us on our social channels. We, we do actually quite a number of giveaways, and a lot of times they are um, global uh, if they're run by certain types of our teams. But for this one specifically, it's United States only, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look right here. Um, so... Pretty much you've got an ROG X670E Crosshair Hero, so pretty much our flagship level AM5 base motherboard, a thousand watt ROG Strix power supply, a Ryzen, uh, this is the latest generation based on the Zen 4 microarchitecture, right? 7950X, so an absolutely beastly uh, processor. 128 gigabytes of DDR5 memory. So that's pretty insane, and it's Expo certified memory. Uh, two terabyte SN850, that's a PCIe Gen 4 uh, NVMe M.2 base SSD, then a Ryogen 2 360 millimeter AIO. Um, then we've got some. Uh, Corsair ARGB fans in there, 120, 140 millimeter. We've got the Land Lee streamer cables, and then a RTX a 3090 Ti, the OC edition under our Tough Gaming graphics cards, and then from there a seven-inch IPS mini display, and that's all inside of that uh, custom painted uh, Fractal Designs chassis. So overall, pretty sweet build, and actually only 2,000 entries. It's pretty good actually entry ratio. I think the last time I checked it when I originally posted it was about 1,500 uh, in terms of the entries. But go ahead and get in on it while you guys can. I'm going to go ahead and drop the link in the chat for you guys. All right, so that takes care of that. And uh, again, I'll also go ahead and leave the uh, link in there, the chat there for our PC DIY group. So if anybody's interested in checking out our group where I have all the featured kind of announcements that go up for giveaways, new products, all that stuff, it all goes up in there, okay? Let me go ahead and see, quickly see if you got any quick questions that might've came up right there. Uh, Andy Kane's asking for Ireland competitions. I'd have to check out the Irish site. Yeah, so um, two recommendations always. If you're part of the group, I will generally post global-based giveaway announcements. So I have done those in the past. So in examples like the recent ROG Evangelion giveaway that we did, that was a global-based giveaway, right? Um, but you always want to follow regional ASUS channels to make sure you're catching specific channel uh, promotions or giveaways that might happen just in that uh, course, that part of the world. Um, and then our global channels will generally be for global participation. So that usually means all regions. And then for uh, ASUS North America, we're generally only going to promote either a global giveaway or something specific to the United States or United States and Canada. All right. Uh, hey, Bianca, happy for joining us here on the stream. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I definitely think it's a pretty cool system. So I definitely say get in on it. And Michael, thanks so much for giving everybody a uh, thumbs up right there. Um, hey, Marlo, if you're having any issues, I would probably recommend it's probably an OS based issue. I can tell you that we've got a lot of people in the group that are actually running with any issues. You can see right here, I've got my system running fine. Um, overall, the current kind of build that we have available for Aura Creator and for Armory Crate is actually quite feature stable. I usually find most problems are either two things. One, people are rolling over old operating systems that they got other drivers or services that are causing problems. Um, or two, they've got mixed RGB software ecosystems, which can also present issues. Um, my best recommendation is if, you know, if you just put together uh, well, if you got like it's an older operating system, start from scratch. Just do a full clean uh, reinstallation of the OS environment. Once you've gone ahead and done that, uh, you should generally be good to go. After you run the installer, you should detect all your hardware. It should do the corresponding updates, and then you should be able to go ahead and control everything. And if you do have to run other software, I recommend a sequential stepping pattern, so don't install them all simultaneously. Start first with Armory Crate. Make sure that you can go ahead and complete all your controls and all your updates, and then after the fact, go ahead and install what other third-party software um, you're going to go ahead and attempt to use within your system. Okay? All right. So that covers that. Um, what do we want next, guys? Uh, I guess we'll quickly talk about the ASUS 7900 series-based graphics cards. This is going to be very quick. It's not a full uh, deep dive kind of introduction into these cards. That'll come a little bit later. Um, we'll see if I actually get my hands, hopefully, maybe on a sample for this. If I do, I'll do a go ahead and uh, do a little bit of a dedicated live stream on these guys, okay? Uh, 
Uh, but pretty much uh, we're going to have uh, the card that we've gone ahead and make an announcement for is going to be for the uh, 7970 XT, right? And of course, AMD's also made an announcement for the, uh, excuse me, for the XTX and for the XT, right? And of course, ASUS will be supporting both of these base graphics cards. This time, we're only announcing a tough gaming base graphics card. So if you're asking about different series, uh, there's no other series. It's just going to be uh, the tough gaming. Um, there will be two different variants. You'll generally find that the majority is going to be, of course, the overclocked base variant and then there will be a non-overclocked base variant as well. Um, overall, the design, it's going to be very similar to what we recently released on the RTX 40 series base graphics cards. Um, so it has the new ID design. It has, of course, an extremely high performance based thermal assembly and heatsink solution, uh, ultra large static pressure optimized axial tech base fans, that really beautiful metal shroud, which just feels really premium, um, ribbing to be able to keep it really nice and stable. Of course, some nice subtle accent RGB lighting that's going to be on, of course, the top and on the side so it's visible in either kind of respect um, and you're also going to have that nice premium backplate on the back of the card as well so overall and anybody wondering a little bit about dimensions it's pretty similar lengthwise it's almost the same uh, in terms of pretty much actually the lengthwise it should be identical to the 40 series but actually uh, with the thickness it's going to be a little bit different uh, exact dimensions again I have this posted in the PCDIY group but overall um, you do need to account that the overall dimensions are are going to be definitely a larger size card. So generally we find the majority of chassis are going to be okay, but if you're really using one of these very compact kind of like mid tower chassis uh, or the most compact ATX chassis, or maybe a chassis where you might front mount the radiator and that eats in a couple of inches, you might not be able to clear support for this graphics card. So it is important to double check, make sure your dimensions do actually accommodate this base graphics card, okay? Uh, we will have the product pages uh, becoming uh, live in the not too distant future. So if you wanna double check that information, let me know. But um, let me go ahead and quickly just check, see if I can give you guys the exact dimensions. Give me one second and um, I'll see if I can give you guys the dimensions right now because I'm pretty sure I, I already had uh, and noted them. Yeah, I already did go ahead and note them. Okay, so I already have them right there. And I will go ahead and drop them into the chat. But in case anybody isn't wondering right here, uh, here are the actual dimensions. Uh, we can go ahead and make that a little bit bigger. Right, so you can see right there, 13.9 inches, right? So that's the overall length, right? Uh, then you've got 6.3 inches and then 2.86 inches, okay? So definitely it is a larger base graphics card. This is pretty much you're talking about a very high-end card, really focused for users that are looking either at 4K gaming, um, you know, 1440p base gaming, or even 1080p if you're talking about ultra high refresh rate gaming. So, you know, 360 hertz, um, to pair up with something like our ROG Strix 360 hertz monitor, or maybe the upcoming 500 hertz monitor, things along those lines, right? Um, so I will go ahead and drop that in the chat there for you guys as well. All right, and you guys can go ahead and check out on the dimensions information for that. All right, so let's go ahead and quickly see if we got any quick questions that came up there. Uh, Stardust, I think you might have seen some stuff, but I can tell you there's no Strix right now planned at this time. So always uh, the best way to find out exactly what's really going to be coming out is actually to watch the PCDIY stream or be involved in the ACS PCDIY group. I will let you know, um, but I can tell you don't expect any Strix cards at this time. Right now there will be just a tough gaming based graphics card. Okay. Will we get a white tough gaming? Uh, no, right now there's no plans for a white tough gaming based graphics card. Um, I know some people have already modded that. Um, it's a little bit trickier actually now doing white uh, for graphics cards because since you've gone to a full metal shroud, uh, plastic is actually easier. Um, so when we take a look at kind of the ROG Strix graphics card in the 30 series, um, we specifically actually chose a shroud that was not metal. It was actually a plastic uh, composite polymer and that actually allowed it an easier kind of uh, level of uh, production when it comes to actually making it uh, white. Um, when it goes through like anodizing and other things, it becomes really kind of actually challenging to kind of do white. And then there's also factors in terms of yield. So actually moving to even a more premium material, which some users say, oh, we want metal, we want metal. I really actually don't have problem with plastic. Uh, some people absolutely feel like they have to have metal. 
you want it, it's great, but it's actually a more challenging material to work with when it comes to actually sometimes these paint propositions. Plastic is still actually challenging when it comes to yield. The yield is not one to one. Um, it's generally worse for white than it is for black. Um, but overall, as of right now, we have no plans for white. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor feedback. We know we really do have the most expansive white ecosystem in the industry when it comes to components. So I know that people always tell me, hey, we want to see more white and white. We've already made every single component in our product line we at least have one white variant. Um, there's no other company that actually I think can say that. Um, so we have really uh, released a comprehensive portfolio in that regard. But right now, um, for the latest 40 series and for this series, there's no plans for a white base graphics card. Okay. All right. Um, hey, Calvin, uh, just make sure to go ahead and keep tuned. Uh, when we have more information, we are co-working with NVIDIA in terms of this. And so when we have uh, information to disclose, we will definitely relay that out, not only into our community, but through other formalized channels. Our service and support team does already also have an internal actually guidance. Uh, so if a user does have an ASUS space graphics card, they can definitely reach out to us and we will assist them in terms of getting uh, their issue resolved. So um, regardless, right now, while there's not any additional information to supply, um, they can definitely go ahead and just reach out to our service and support team if they have experienced an issue. Okay. Um, Scott is asking about the PG3T UQXC. No update. Uh, if we have one, I would talk about it. So uh, just make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned um, on that front. You'll probably see more, some more information regarding monitors at uh, CES 2023. Okay. All right. Um, let's go ahead. And uh, actually speaking of graphics cards, I do want to go ahead and touch on one other update. Um, and this is going to be actually for 40 series. So let me go ahead and actually do this. Give me one second here. Actually, I didn't even make a tag for this. So I guess let me make one quickly here. All right, so if you do happen to be uh, an owner of an ASUS 40 series graphics card, so you essentially have an ASUS ROG Strix 4090 or an ASUS uh, Tough Gaming 4090 based graphics card, there is actually a new uh, vBIOS. So vBIOS is kind of similar to the BIOS that I talked about for the motherboards, uh, but they actually are the vBIOS. So they're the video BIOS that actually defines different operating parameters. We have gone ahead and released an actual vBIOS for these cards. Uh, they're listed under the drivers and utility. It's actually for all four variants. So it doesn't matter whether you have a 4090 standard, if you have a 4090 OC, Tough Gaming or RG Strix, it doesn't matter. All of them uh, would apply to that. Right here, you'll see that there's a V2. Just want to go ahead and click this download button. Once you go ahead and click the download button, there's a simple little EXE that will download. You're just going to double click the EXE, we'll run it and it will flash your vBIOS. Um, it is not a performance related vBIOS. It's, uh, it's actually designed for enhancing interoperability and compatibility with the latest generation platforms. So like AM5 and uh, Z series based chipsets. There's also some optimization that will be working with NVIDIA's drivers. Um, so overall, it's minor. It's not necessarily critical. We do recommend it, um, but uh, it is a very simple update. If you happen to update with the prior release vBIOS update version one, it's essentially the same thing. This version two is the same update. We just actually made some changes to it in terms of how the actual uh, detection functionality works on the platform that you're running to help to improve its overall interoperability compatibility on other platforms. So essentially just people that run the update, um, they should have now no issues regardless of which platform they're running to actually complete the update. But if you already completed the prior V1 update, you don't need to run this V2 update, okay? All right. Okay, uh, that I think covers us there in terms of that vBIOS update. All right, so um, that should give us us there. All right, pretty cool. All right, um, let me go ahead and head back over here to my file. Got the giveaways out of the way. All right, I think let's go ahead and uh, talk about some of the new product releases. And again, if anybody has any questions, comments, feel free to go ahead and uh, drop that in there and let me know, okay? Um, Master Sentry saying, I think an all silver card would be great with uh, white or black PC builds. Um, yeah, probably not gonna happen. That's pretty niche for one, uh, that type of design aesthetic. Um, you know, we have already done white in the past. It was very popular with, you know, the ROG Strix series where we did actually the 20 series, we had a white card and in the 30 series, we had a white card, but making a specific silver card, I don't know that necessarily we would do just a pure silver card. Plus also when you get into more specialized heatsink designs, I'll tell you, to be very frank, I spent years, almost two years with our design team to even have them custom actually coat the full heatsink assembly to do a pure back 
pure black heatsink assembly. It was significantly challenging. It didn't have the greatest yield. Uh, aesthetically, I thought it was fantastic and almost no other manufacturer has ever put in the work to ever do that. Um, you see that sometimes in some heatsink assemblies for like a tower heatsink, but we did it for our graphics card. Um, and I can tell you just media, Almost no media ever talked about it, didn't acknowledge it. Um, and it's challenging because when you're going to get, um, you know, evaluated when it comes to price and considerations and production and even users, some users didn't even also note it. And we spent that time to kind of aesthetically take it to you on a further level. So some of these things are always a balancing act between on how much real feedback we see from just a quote unquote niche set of users on really they're actually representative of the larger market. Um, and then also to a degree, you know, um, how much kind of recognition we can also see from not only the users, but also in media review. And this is a very challenging situation. So there's always a lot of factors when you get into kind of trying to design things that are a little bit more niche oriented, right? It's just a lot of different factors to keep in mind. Okay. Um, that kept us this there. Uh, let's go ahead and just keep moving things along here. Um, I want to go ahead and give some quick updates on just some products that uh, are essentially going to be coming out to market. And actually, speaking of a niche product, we've got one that uh, we did go ahead and finally produce. Uh, speaking of niche products, right? So uh, let's go ahead and bring up my little slides right here. This is going to be the ROG Maximus Z790 Apex. It's finally getting ready to come out. Um, pretty much, uh, we're going to now start talking about the products that we're going to be having coming out essentially within about the next, uh, you know, seven to about 14 days. Sometimes it can take a little bit longer than this in terms of channel availability. Um, but the, of course, the Apex board is really going to be the special aspect is one. It's the first motherboard that we've done since the prior generation Sobronco series where it has a white PCB design. Um, it's actually quite challenging, very expensive to be able to produce this. This is a limited production motherboard. It means that we will not be making this indefinitely. So if you want to get it, you want to get it while it's available. Okay. Um, and it is a very high performance XOC centric motherboard. So XOC means extreme overclocking. Even if you're not extreme overclocking, but you care about overclocking and you care especially about DRAM overclocking, this is the board for you. It does come with some very cool additions like the Voltition, which is a cool accessory. Um, it's our two dim focus board. So that means that it's very, very focused at having the highest level of DRAM scaling. So um, 13th gen Alder Lake, excuse me, Raptor Lake series CPUs are already even far better than Alder Lake uh, memory controller, uh, which was already really re impressive. Um, Alder Lake, you could routinely generally see about up to 6,000 to 6,400 MT and maybe better, better performing IMCs could get about 6,600. Uh, with Raptor Lake, we're really seeing consistently about 7,000 to about 7,400 and actually even then a pretty decent amount of CPUs being between 74 to 7,800 MT. Um, and then in a, a two dim board, you actually increase the probability by a couple of uh, actually bins in terms of actually how you can go ahead and bump up the frequency. So if you really want to take advantage of some of these ultra high performing kits that are coming to market in that 76 7800, uh, 8000 MT kind of category, then this is really going to be the board for you. And it still does give you a very strong foundation in terms of, you know, a high number of M.2 base SSDs. Uh, you still get, you know, things like 60 watt fast charging, PCI Gen 5 support for, of course, future graphics, uh, Wi-Fi 6E, 2.5 gigabit LAN, 20 gigabits um, base connectivity on there, isolated audio design. So you still get a lot of the great features. I would say though, for most users, I think that the Maximus Hero is the kind of better board to buy in terms of kind of the features, functions, and specifications. But if you definitely want something that looks unique and um, is distinct and definitely is gonna push the envelope in terms of DRAM overclocking, then the Apex is gonna be the board for you. Uh, price point on the Apex is going to be 699, okay? So in terms of that price point is going to be the Apex, all right? Uh, next up, let's go ahead and uh, also give an update here on the ProArt Z790 Creator. Uh, this one is also going to be coming out very shortly here. Um, you see, I've got the uh, got the picture for the board over here somewhere. <laughs> um, let me see, ProArt here. Oh, do I not have my ProArt Creator? Okay, uh, I should have the. Okay, that's fine. I'll just go ahead and bring it up on the, on the actual product page. I thought I had uh, the images set aside here. Uh, but the big update I think with the Z79 Creator is, is that it's gonna probably be the most cost aggressive model if you're interested in having 10 gigabit LAN and Thunderbolt then this will be the model for you. Uh, let me actually go ahead and, and amend right here the pricing so you can see it right off the bat. So the Creator is gonna be $469.99. There we go. 
All right. Uh, so here you can see, this is the creator board. It's got, of course, a really clean kind of refined stylized design aesthetic. Um, I'll see if I can bring up the other images. I know I have them right here, but again, the big thing is going to be that this one does have a support for up to four M.2 base SSDs. All of them have heat sinks. You have dual PCI gen five slots that are also on this board. This is also something that's going to be generally only on the kind of the highest end motherboards. Most of the motherboards will generally only have one single kind of PCI gen five slot, right? This one has multiples. Uh, you've got 10 gig LAN along with dual LAN and you also have um, the Thunderbolt 4 or 40 gigabit space connectivity on here. Um, and you also have our kind of out of, man out of band management options, which is the Asus Control Center Express Control technology, which is pretty cool. And this board also, if you're interested in kind of performance tuning and overclocking, it does also support our Asus AIOC technology, which if you want to find out more about that, just watch the live stream that we have that fully jumps into all of the cool aspects about how Asus AIOC works, okay? Um, let me go ahead and quickly see if we got any questions right there on this board while I, I can quickly see if I can bring up the images for this one, just in case anybody wants to see them a little bit closer. Um, I know I should have them actually over here, so give me one second. Um, C690. Oh, here we go. Pro Art Creator. Perfect. All right. Yep. So here you can see, this is uh, the ProArt Creator, and there you can see there's the IO. So it's got a really nice kind of clean stylized design aesthetic. I love this really refined black design of this nice kind of smoked diffused housing that we have right here. Um, and then of course these nice little gold accents that are on there. And then here you can see on the rear IO, all high speed and there's no low uh, kind of USB 2 ports that are on this board. There's not even any five gigabit. They're all at least 10 gigabit um, on here. And then of course you've got your two Thunderbolt, which are gonna be of course even faster performing, which is gonna be up to 40 gigabits, 10G, 2.5G and Wi-Fi 6E, so uh, a lot. And this is the only board that we do have that also features display port in. So if you wanna have that full kind of a Thunderbolt ecosystem where you're actually carrying over the signal from your graphics card through that connection, then this board would also be able to facilitate that for you. All right, uh, let me go ahead and quickly just see there if we got any questions. Uh, Michelle's asking for the ProArt Z790 in Italy. I can't tell you. Uh, you would have to double check. Um, you know, Asus is independently operated in every single region. So like Asus Japan, Asus Germany, Asus Benelux, um, they all have their own respective product matrices. So you'd actually have to check with Asus Italy uh, to confirm if they're gonna carry this model. Not every region will carry every motherboard model because maybe they don't have enough demand to carry those models. So you do wanna go ahead and keep that in mind there, okay? Uh, James is asking about the Cetro True Priorless Pro. That's a really cool, of course, hybrid-based uh, in-ear kind of monitor headsets, wired and wireless. Uh, we'll have probably more of an update at the very beginning of the year. So I think that's probably going to be released probably closer in January timeframe. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Excuse me. The PG27AQN 1440p availability in Canada. So that's the brand new ROG Swift 360 hertz 1440p monitor. I think that's pretty much the dream monitor right now. It's overall the kind of best, I think, uh, high performance based gaming centric display on the market. Um, Canada availability is still probably a little bit out. I would probably say at least maybe about a month. Um, tag me in the PCDIY group um, or email me at PCDIY at ACUS.com and I'll see if I can check with our product managers on when we maybe roughly expect a little bit more what the overall availability looks like for that monitor, okay? Uh, let me go ahead and just see if there was any other quick questions on there. Uh, Andy was asking full ATX based board. Yes, so the Apex is a standard ATX. It's not EATX, so it's not like the extreme board, which is an extended form factor, okay? Oh, Snef is giving us a thumbs up. He really, really likes that. Okay, very, very cool. Um, Derek is asking is I have the ROG GT AX11000 and I have the Asus Zen Wi-Fi AX Mini for the mesh system. Is there an improved router or is this the latest and greatest? We have a couple of new models. Uh, Wi-Fi 6E is of course the latest specification and we also have the actual new AX11000 Pro which is actually getting ready to come out and there's also a router that I'll be talking about shortly which will be the brand new um, Asus RT um, 
uh, AXE 7800, which would actually be another model as well. So um, there's actually a few other models that are now kind of higher. That's still a very, very high end model because it's tri-band um, and it's Wi-Fi 6, uh, but there are some now higher performing units that have even more high speed multi gigabit LAN ports, higher performing SOCs. So that's the chipset. And then also even more um, bands that are available, whether you're talking about uh, in enhanced uni bands, so like 5.9 gigahertz, Wi-Fi 6E with 6 gigahertz, right? Or even moving over into a quad vein based router. All right. Uh, Old Wolf Tech is asking us right here is, um, what made you all go with the bigger cooler in the 4090? It all comes down to um, acoustics and temperatures, right? So, you know, we've done a lot of extensive polling. The last, large, the last largest poll that we did uh, was over 100,000 users, right? Um, from varying communities, through surveys, through monitoring e-tail reviews and so many different factors and users really care about temperature and acoustics and uh it really there's no way to escape physics right just going with larger performing heatsink assembly really allows you to of course have the flexibility to ensure outstanding thermal performance especially if you're going to increase what's called the tgp tbp so that's the actual total graphics board power take for instance like on the rg strix card uh, that card comes with the default overclock and a 500 watt uh, tgp tbp rating versus the traditional 450 watts so it's actually not only um pulling more, but it's actually also operating a higher level, right? And so to be able to ensure even still better than uh, Founders Edition based performance, right? That's what really actually we're gonna spend the time and effort to be able to maximize on. So, and that's historically always been the case. We've never generally been as small as let's say the slimmest cards because our priority is always focusing on acoustics and thermals, okay? Ultra Precision Technologies, any news on the uh, 1000 watt SFXL Loki PSU? Yeah, so actually I gave you up, uh, an update for that in last week's stream uh, for all of our PSUs. Right now, the probably earliest we're looking at is the very ending of December and now the beginning of January. So they've actually been pushed out a little bit. Uh, if you want to find out a full update, you can either make sure to check out the group um, or Ultra Positions. Feel free to email me. You've got my email. And if you guys actually want to check out a very cool channel that does some really cool stuff, they're actually uh, finished actually, I think, posting up a review and they'll be having a build on um, a mini ITX based board or actually our AM5 based mini ITX board. Make sure to go ahead and check them out. They're very, very cool. Oh, hey, DePoets is in the house. Hey, very, very cool, man. The Z79 Pro Art is being sent to me review. I will have an update BIOS. Uh, do you guys think it's, yeah, it's a fantastic board. I think that's a perfect pairing and um, very, very cool. I'd be really interested to see what your thoughts are on that brand new uh, multi-core enhancement feature that we just introduced. And also, if this is the first time you're checking out one of our recent boards, I know in one of your systems, you're not running an ASUS board. I'd really love to see what you think about our advanced machine learning algorithm that we have for the ASUS AIT tech. ASUS AOC technology. It's really quite robust and it's really advanced. Um, and if you want, feel free to reach out to me, man. Let's let's talk offline and uh, we can definitely dive into some of the really cool stuff. But I think that's a great board. Um, you know, I'd love to maybe have got you the ROG Strix Z790-E um, or also the Hero board. It's got some cool, more specialized stuff, especially for water cooling that I think is pretty cool. But the Pro Art, it's really hard to beat for its overall kind of mix to features and functions, especially I think if you like 10G and I know you like your 10G. So um, I think in that regard, it's a great choice. All right. Um, all right. I think that takes care of that. Let's go ahead and keep rocking and rolling this, guys. Uh, so that is that creator board. Uh, speaking of also other boards that we've got coming coming out right here, uh, where we got, that's it, so right there. Um, keep it in the vein of mini ITX is we've got this guy right here is the ROG Strix B650E dash I gaming Wi-Fi. So this is gonna be of course the follow up to the X670E uh, where we have a mini ITX based board, but this is definitely gonna be coming in at a lower price point. So if you're interested in building a small form factor AM5 based motherboard, and then this is one you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and check out. Uh, let me go ahead and just drop the price in there for this guy as well. This is going to be 329, okay. And uh, this is, I think it'd be a really great choice for those of you that again, are gonna be wanting to go with a small form factor AM5 based motherboard and not have to spend as much as what you would have on let's say the X670E, especially on a smaller form factor board, you could argue that there's not as much merit to go with X670E because one of the big benefits of X670E is the dual chipsets, which gives you so much more IO for a lot more rear IO and a lot from a lot more PCIe expansion. But since you're limited, this is a mini ITX based motherboard, um, this might be kind of maybe the more balanced solution in that regard, right? So here we have uh, this board, um, you're gonna have a still a very performant high grade uh, 10 power stage 
space design. This is a teamed power stage, so very, very good transient performance. So it's able to handle power delivery, you know, coming at idle and peaking out. And this board still offers a lot of really impressive features, like we've got dynamic OC switcher, which will allow you to go ahead and automatically have a per core CCX space overclocked and a PBO uh, based overclock simultaneously. Uh, you don't actually have to pick one or the other. We have our brand new um, CoreFlex technology, which allows you to actually target different types of actually uh, values for maximizing boosting behavior, especially at lighter values, um, in terms of, excuse me, lighter loads. Uh, that is a really, really cool, impressive feature. Takes a little bit of time to tune, but if you definitely want to maximize perf, it's a really, really cool feature. And of course, you've got a uh, DOCP feature. If you want to have uh, XMP memory support, you've got AMD Expo. Um, this does have an OPT temp sensor on there. So if you guys want that closed water cooling loop, you're good to go. You've got dual M.2 base support, uh, PCI Gen 5 for the M.2 and for the primary physical by 16 slots. Uh, you've got your USB-C internal header, your legacy USB 3, your two SATA ports right there. You've got your ARGB legacy and, of course, three pin on there, AIO pump header, and then you've got your CPU and your chassis fan headers on there. These are thicker pins. Um, always, we do actually use our thicker pins. These are ProCool power connectors. These actually support a higher level of current handling, which helps to reduce actually impedance and also carries a higher level of actually current handling. Um, nice, high quality, of course, VRM heatsink design on there to make sure it's nice and cool. Uh, we have gone ahead and maximized what we call the keep out zone, which helps to maximize compatibility and interoperability with a wide range of coolers. Um, you can also see there is an active VRM assist fan that's in there to help to go ahead and maximize uh, uh, kind of low temperatures for that VRM assembly, especially if you're going to heavily put this board under load. And this board does also have the PBO enhancement feature. So the PBO enhancement feature, if I still have the UEFI slide, I'll show this in a moment. But similar to that feature that we talked about in the very beginning uh, for like Intel based platforms, um, we do have essentially a PBO enhancement feature that will allow you to target 90C, 80C or 70C. So again, if you're somebody that wants to essentially still kind of maximize performance, but you want to reduce a little bit of thermal envelope, then you can go ahead and target the PBO enhancement mode and pick 90C, 80C or 70C. So we have three different temperature targets that you can go ahead and pick from. Okay, uh, and there's your VRIO. So you've got one USB, two USB, HDMI. That's, of course, for the integrated Radeon graphics that you have now on there, 10 gigabit base USB. Then you've got 20 gigabit, two type C, and this also supports display port. So that's display port alt, meaning you can go ahead and su support um, actually monitor from this connection outside of having a 20 gigabits high speed base connection. Another type A, 10 gigabits, 2.5 G LAN and Wi-Fi 6E. And then you've got the flex key button and then your USB boss flashback along with your optical audio output, okay? And that's the other kind of big difference is keep in mind on the X670E-I, that one has the external audio solution. It does not have an actual internal audio solution, right? So if you want the more traditional audio design, this is gonna be the better choice for you, okay? All right, so that is gonna be the ROG Strix uh, B650E. Dash I gaming. All right, very very cool. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I have that PBO uh, enhancement mode feature right here. Ah, yep, I got it right here, guys. Cool. Okay. Uh, now, one thing I will note, of course, also for some people that might be wondering, is uh, that board does not have the ASUS AIOC technology that the X670 boards do carry. And if you're wondering what the difference there is, that if you use Curve Optimizer, you know that you actually have to set essentially an offset, right? Um, which can be quite tedious, where you actually have to have voltage offsets per each one of the actual steps. Um, with ASUS AIOC, we will automatically pre-populate the entire actually PBO curve for you. So it's a significant time savings to be able to maximize performance and efficiency from that overclock perspective. Here, the board still supports that, but you're gonna have to manually input all of those values. So it's quite a bit more tedious. So that's also so where there's a little bit of a difference between the X670-I and then the B650-I in terms of supporting that ASUS AIOC. Um, here is the 
the PBO enhancement feature I was talking about, where you can see right there in the thermal limit, you'll have level 1 90C, level 2 80C, and level 3 70C. So again, you reduce a little bit of that multi-thread uh, kind of performance, but the 7950X has so much multi-threaded performance. Again, if you're somebody that is super sensitive about temperatures, again, if it was me, I don't care because the thermal temperature performance that it's rated for, it's actually designed for 95C and the actual thermal junction temperature is actually still higher than that. You can actually set that up to a, a much higher temperature. So you're not actually at the actual peak. Some people think that the peak is actually 95 and the peak is not actually 95. It's designed to operate in 95 and then it even has a higher threshold. Um, but if for some reason you just have that preference that you just want to just run a little bit cooler, maybe a little bit more efficiently, then you can go ahead and pick one of these value targets. Okay. All right. So that takes care of the uh, B650-I. Um, Jonathan's asking, will the Apex be available through Amazon and Micro Center? I'd like to avoid Newegg as possible. Um, it should be available through Amazon and uh, through Micro Center. You're going to have to maybe tag me in the group and I'll double check on that. I do believe it should be available also at Micro Center. Uh, but Amazon um, should be fine. Um, and Micro Center, yes, I do believe. Um, the thing you want to keep in mind is that just logistically, channel partners take different times to skew in products. Newegg is generally the fastest working with us. So when we generally announce something to like the time that they list it, it can generally be the optimal time frame, which is like three to like seven days. Amazon Amazon can take a month sometimes. Um, so it can be a significantly longer time in terms of them getting actually things to be reflected and listed online in terms of their inventory. Uh, Micro Center, because they're a brick and mortar retailer, are pretty quick as well. So generally, usually from our channel availability announcement to having it uh, available in Micro Center, it's pretty similar to Newegg in terms of that time frame. So I'd say usually like seven to 10 days. Okay. Okay, uh, I think that probably covers that. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, are the ROG Strix 4090s being regularly stocked? Yes, they are. Um, I haven't uh, checked with our PM team on when the next restock is, but we are actively, trust me, we are actively working to push for production as much as possible on any of our uh, base graphics cards. Um, I'll try to see if I can work with our team to find out on kind of when the next forecasted kind of rollout is, but we are actively working on both Tough Gaming and ROG Strix base cards, okay? Um, so. Uh, as always, just keep monitoring, you know, any of the channel partners that you're looking at when it comes to availability. All right. So let's go ahead and keep moving this along here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so we got the creator, we got the Apex, we got the B650-I. So let's actually go for something a little bit different and a little bit new. Um, and that's going to be this guy right here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Pro WS 680 Ace. So this might be kind of like a little bit of like, a head turn like hey what's what's actually going on with this board so this is actually going to be something a little bit different um so traditionally most of the boards that we usually cover are going to be our of course uh, one of our standard series so that's going to be prime pro art uh tough gaming rg strix or rg maximus but we actually also do have our ws series of motherboards and so the ws series of motherboards can actually be featured on a z series chipset or they can also be featured on a more professional chipset and here on this chipset you actually have the w680 chipset so this is a follow-up from the prior generation w480 chipset so really what's the main difference main difference is going to be official ecc memory support so the vast majority of users do not generally utilize ecc even under many professional configurations but for some users that run extended long duration, what are called uptime cycles. So that means they essentially leave their systems actively running for extended periods of time. We're not talking about just a few hours. We could be talking about 10, 15, 24 hours. Um, they could be literally leaving their systems running uh, for an extended period of time, either based on work or based on kind of general user experience where they don't over ever even shut down their systems. Uh, ECC does generally have an advantage in this system. Now, most of the time, these users are also going to generally not be overclocked. But this uh, platform does support overclocking. So you can't overclock the CPU, you can't overclock the memory, uh, but generally most users uh, for this platform would probably be focusing at running stock operation and then be running ECC memory, which will definitely not be anywhere near as fast as 
uh, non-ECC-based memory. So generally when you're talking about ECC-based memory, it's going to be far more conservative in terms of its actual uh, frequency support. Uh, but if you care about, like I said, running larger densities, highest level stability, then you want to consider ECC-based memory. That's going to really kind of be one of the key hallmarks. Otherwise, it's a very clean, stylized design aesthetic. You can see it's really suited kind of for professionals. Got one M.2 SSD here, another M.2 SSD here, another M.2 base SSD, dual PCI Gen 5 support that's also going to be on this board. Uh, one cool thing that will also be a little bit different, this one does also have the Thunderbolt header down here, which can be supported. Uh, it does have an optional temp sensor, uh, but this is kind of cool. This board does actually have what's called the Slim SAS. So even though there's actually four SATA ports right here, through the Slim SAS connector, you can support another for actually uh, SSDs, uh, SATA base SSDs, so you can even have more uh, SSDs. So again, in this type of configuration, it's not necessarily purely about speed, it might be about the density of storage configurations. And so there's still, of course, a wide prevalence of SATA based storage devices that either might be existing in prior builds that you want to carry over or that you have gone ahead already adopted into. So that is the reason why this unit has not only traditional SATA, but then it also supplements that with the SIM SAS, which gives you four more SATA ports that are going to be on that board as well. Um, I don't have finalized pricing for you yet on this board. There will be potentially two variants. One is with an advanced um, out-of-band management option. So that means an advanced kind of connection option to be able to control the board. Um, and we will also, I believe, have one that has the advanced IPMI control card. And I'm going to show you what that actually means in terms of that. But availability for this should probably be closer to uh, maybe the very end of this month. Okay, in terms of the overall time frame. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I can show you this guys here. Give me one second. So the card is pretty cool right here. Um, uh, also on the on that motherboard, it is no 10G, but it's dual 2.5 gig networking on that one. So it's do, uh, excuse me, dual 2.5 gig networking. So this is the uh, kind of pretty cool little accessory that you can actually have here right here is this is the IPMI expansion card. So the IPMI expansion card essentially will allow you to go and have access to all these fan headers as well as temperature sen sensor headers all directly um, in out of band. So traditionally what we mean by out of band is that means out of kind of the operating system environment. So you can directly connect to the system and you could actually have full control over the cooling. Uh, you could update the UEFI. You can do all kinds of low level advanced monitoring, updating and control to the system um, as well as even control all the actual tuning characteristics. Um, now we already did note previously in the past that this IPMI my expansion card is actually even compatible on some of our other motherboards in the kind of performance chipset category. It does require a specific UEFI, and this is sold as a standalone accessory. And then it has to connect to the motherboard via USB 2 header and needs a supplemental power, right? And then, of course, you connect your fans to it as opposed to connecting your fans to the motherboard. Uh, but this is also kind of one of those additional value pieces that we have there for users that may be looking to take advantage of this. Okay. So that is going to be uh, the WS uh, motherboard, pretty cool motherboard. And again, uh, probably coming out sometime in the end of November timeframe. Is there a B650E micro ATX? No, uh, from what I remember, um, no micro ATX. If you want micro ATX, um, you would have to take a look at either standard B650, or of course you could also take a look at, if you wanted really kind of high end performance, then take a look at the Gene, right? The Gene would be the board that you would want to take a look at. That's gonna really be actually on pace with any of our flagship ATX based boards because it's a um, it's the first essentially high end micro ATX board that we've ever done for AMD right there. So that would be the Crosshair X670E Gene board, okay? Uh, Lemmy has a question here. So hi there, just got a new PC, uh, 4090 Strix, 1300K Asus Z790 Hero, 32 gigabytes Trident Z5, 7600. The company built my PC said they weren't able to enable XMP. So uh, without knowing more information, it's kind of hard to tell you, right? Um, we have a really good post that actually exists in our group. It's called DDR5 Insights. I actually spent a lot of time to detail exactly um, like the performance scaling uh, insights that you want to keep in mind when it comes to uh, DDR5 memory. Now, 
Um, most 13th gen Raptor Lake series CPUs will support comfortably a 7,000 MT memory divider, with actually the majority even comfortably supporting about 7,200 and maybe a little bit more than that. Once you get past about 7,400, you start to get a little bit more into a gray area, which means that if like I took 10 CPUs, there would be a percentage of those CPUs that would not be able to support the memory divider running at a higher level. Now that doesn't mean that the Hero can't support it. Um, I can show you the actual Hero running 7,600 memory on it, but it means because my memory control controller, my CPU is good enough, right? And so again, that 10 CPU example, there could be like maybe six CPUs that are good enough and four CPUs that wouldn't be good enough. Um, so that is kind of a factor that you have to evaluate. Now, this is only applicable in two DIMM configurations. If you're somebody that's running a four DIMM configuration, this entirely goes out the window and there's a whole lot more that you have to keep in mind. And that value would go significantly down. It would be much closer to generally between 54 to 5600 with maybe the better IMCs being able to support about 6000 MT. Um, so Generally, what I would tell you is that your target value should really be 7,000 to about 7,200. And then anything over that, um, you would have to really kind of know that your CPU can get there. Um, the one advantage that you have is if you did buy like very, very high grade memory, the benefit is even if your memory controller can't hit 7600 and you have to run it maybe 72, you can generally tighten up some of your sub timings because it's going to be a little bit less uh, stressful, right? You're able to actually bring that down. So if let's say the timing set was like, uh, C36, you might be able to bring it down to like C34, or C32 or something like that. So you can go ahead and play around with that. Um, but let me go ahead and uh, link you this um, post that we have here. It's a great write-up that I have and hopefully it should help you better understand this. It also has examples of actually all the memory dividers. Uh, so right here, it's called this DDR5 Insights post. Um, it's not really that long. It should really only take you a couple minutes to read it. Uh, if then you read it, um, it's got a lot of good information in there and you can actually see in here, I even include things like, see right here, here's 7600. You asking about 7600? That's actually right there on a Z690 Hero, full one hour memory stress test at 7600. So it's possible, but again, the memory controller has to be good enough to be able to support that. So it's not that it's not possible. It's really gonna be coming down to your memory controller. All right, so uh, let me go ahead and uh, share that link with you there. If you guys are interested in that, you guys can check that out. Okay, so that takes care of that. All right, uh, so let's see what else we got right here. Uh, we talked about the 7970 XT, the B650, the giveaway, um, the Apex, uh, the B650-I. Okay, so let's go ahead and keep moving this along to some of our other items here. So give me a second. All right, so... <clears throat> Uh, let's go ahead and quickly talk about this guy. This is going to be a pretty cool little addition right here. Uh, this is a, a mobile monitor that we've actually announced way back uh, quite some time ago. And I know that we've actually had a lot of people that are pretty interested in this one. Um, this one is going to be coming in at $499. So let me go ahead and just quickly make a point of this right here. So this is going to be a 32 uh, by 9 uh, IPS dual orientation touchscreen pen compatible based monitor 14 inches it's 1920 by, five, by 550 in terms of the resolution uh, factory calibrated um, it's very interesting kind of um, monitor that we've got right here so uh, you can actually check it out right here so this is going to be the ProArt PA 147 CDV so again 14 inches factory calibrated 100% coverage in terms of 709 and 100% sRGB. Kalman verified, it's USB-C and HDMI in terms of the connectivity, 10 point touch, plus it also has MPPT, so that means actually touch stylus support um, that you can go ahead and in there. It also has our ASUS dial, um, so that you can actually go ahead and have on-screen control for different types of actually options within applications uh, and Windows. So this can actually be mapped to different types of Windows functions, but can also be mapped inside of applications like Lightroom and Photoshop, Premiere, uh, After Effects, a lot of different kind of cool elements. Um, so. Here you can actually see, you can imagine it, it can be configured in a couple of different ways. You could be using it with a desktop configuration and a more kind of creation centric uh, type of setup, where here you can actually see that that's in like Lightroom, where you could actually have contrast, brightness, different types of parameters, quick action, uh, quick actions um, that you would actually want to go ahead and adjust, right? Um, or also here you can see like in a laptop setup, again, if you take advantage of our ASUS stylus, we do have an ASUS MPP 2.0 certified stylus, right? Um, you have a lot of flexibility in terms of how this can go ahead and be set up. 
Uh, connectivity, as I noted, full size HDMI. So this means you can make it work with whatever you want, right? But it does also have USB C, and that allows you to really nicely actually have power and display, or also power and display. So it's actually quite flexible in that regard um, in terms of how you can go ahead and connect it. Um, it does have an integrated kind of kickstand, so it stands on its own in terms of adjustment, and you can go ahead and adjust the actual angle that it's visible at, right? And you can go ahead and have it in a vertical or in a horizontal orientation. So if you, maybe you wanted this for like email, for notifications, for like tweets, um, you know, for Discord, for, tat, for chats like in Teams or Slack, you could do that. There's a lot of different ways to kind of play around with it. And again, having the touch functionality also allows you to go ahead and scroll, move, tap, expand, do a lot of the things that are really nice when it comes to using a touch-based interface, right? And some people ask, can I run touch and non-touch at the same time? So if your primary monitor is not non-touch, but then your second monitor is touch, yes, it can work in that regard. So you can have a touch and non-touch base setup available to you. Uh, very thin and compact in terms of being able to slide it in. And again, here you have that nice smooth um, integrated ASUS style that will be available to you. So I think this is one of the coolest monitors that we've got for those of you that are looking to maybe be able to enhance your overall kind of desktop setup, be able to also have something that you could throw in your bag if you wanted the additional flexibility of, like I said, having a touch screen secondary uh, interface to be able to go ahead and take notes on, be able to go ahead and have secondary information laid out on, I think is a very, very cool based accessory. Again, you can use it portably, you could use it stationary wise. And it does also come with this nice padded sleeve to make sure it doesn't get damaged. So overall, pretty, pretty sweet. And again, be coming out very, very shortly, coming in at $499, all right? Um, Mastery saying with a DIY builds question section in Discord or Facebook, it's linked in the description. So that's our PCDIY Facebook group. So it's not like an outward Facebook, it's in a dedicated group that we have available. Okay. Uh, Michelle's got, I've got an ROG Strix 3090C with a 13900K, 32 gigabytes of Denegade Renegade, um, 6400MT 6, Pro Art. Is that okay? You should be okay. Um, the Memory scaling, again, like I said, on 13900K is quite a bit better than on 1200. So on 1200, you generally saw that it was about 6,000 was a standard and generally saw some of the IMCs be able to hold 62 to 6400. Now that improved memory scaling does also exist on Z690. So if you take 13th gen and run it on Z690, memory that couldn't run can actually start to run at some of those higher values. So in examples, you can start to run like 64, 66, and even 6800 on some Z690 based motherboards. But the signal integrity on Z790 is still superior so it's it's a higher likelihood of being able to maintain stability within those configurations but i would say with 6400 you have a fairly good likelihood of being able to run that uh, on that board uh, just make sure you've gone ahead and updated the uefi and critically make sure to watch the beginning of the stream where i talked about making sure that you update that management engine firmware that is critical to be able to ensure the best experience okay um tommy i don't have an answer for you when it comes to the restock on the asus uh page uh we don't prioritize the asus page um over let's say channel partners we prioritize channel partners so micro center new egg amazon adorama bnh any one of our partners so they will take primary precedence over um us restocking the asus uh web store um, so in that regard don't necessarily look to kind of always see the fastest restocks on the asus store compared to channel partners okay all right uh let's go ahead and keep moving this along <clears throat> And next up, uh, we're going to go to another monitor here. Let's go Tough Gaming. We're going to go with the Tough Gaming. This is going to be the Tough Gaming. Uh, it's a long name right there. That's the VG34 VQE L1A. Okay. Uh, this one is going to be coming in at 349. And get that in there. So this is going to be a curved display, 1500R. Um, I think it's a 100 hertz refresh rate, uh, 3440 by 1440. It's a VA panel, of course, um, FreeSync certified, higher than standard brightness at about 300 nits. So a lot of people's monitors, if they're on older monitors, probably somewhere between like 150 to like 200 nits. So it'll be a little bit brighter. New ID design with pretty thin bezels, all black base bezel design and um, a black base stand. Um, and 125% sRGB coverage, which is going to be pretty nice at, at giving you a little bit kind of more punch um, to your actual image as well. So um, overall, 
it's uh, definitely, a, I think, a nice option right there. And you also have ergonomic adjustment and a USB hub in there. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this guy here. So this is going to be the Tough VG34 VQEL1A, again, coming in at 349. So this is a 1344, 1344, <laughs> excuse me, 3444 by 1440 based VA panel, 1500R uh, in terms of the actual curvature, right? Um, as I noted right there, you've got, of course, your integrated uh, joystick to be able to go ahead and access the on-screen display, USB 3 hub, integrated power supply, which is really nice for clean cable management, just one single cable that runs out, HDMI DP, and of course your line out right there, which can be used for headphones or for speakers. You of course do have Visa mount support if you do want that. And there is actually a third right here, um, actually USB port right there. So that's nice for maybe running a secondary cable if you wanted that for like a mouse or a bungee or something else, right? But you've got two right there and you've got another one right there, okay? Um, Overall, very clean, simple, stylized design, right, in terms of the overall design aesthetic. This monitor is now, though, integrating something we used to offer on the RG monitors, which is at the top means that it has a threaded tripod mount. Um, that can be used for all kinds of stuff. You could put a light, you could attach a mirrorless camera, a webcam, um, you could attach, you know, a mount for a cell phone. You could do a lot of different things with it. It's really, it's up to you. It's a quarter thread mount, so you can go ahead and mount whatever you want to it. So a lot of flexibility in terms of just having that integrated at the top of the monitor. Uh, this monitor does also also fully support um, our display widget technology. So if you're not familiar with display widget, uh, let me go ahead and show you right here, but give me one second. I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can pull this up quickly here. All right, let's go ahead and bring that up. And so display widget is this little guy right here. And it's a cool little application actually will allow you to control the monitor inside of the, uh, the inside of the operating system. So instead of having to physically touch buttons, you can adjust like the brightness, the contrast, sharpness. I really like using what's called AppSync, which means I can actually set profiles for my monitor based on the EXE. So the moment that I launch the application, so if I jump into something like, you know, Forza versus Doom Eternal versus like Cyberpunk, I could have different actually um, parameters set for my monitor. So if I want things like shadow boost enabled, or I wanted more contrast, or I wanted more brightness, or I wanted maybe to go into FPS mode, right? I could have that dynamically switch. And then let's say I go to my web browser, or I open up my photo viewer, I could go to like sRGB because I want it to be the most color accurate, right? So I have a lot of flexibility to be able to go ahead and tune this. And I don't physically have to adjust the joystick. I don't have to go into the on-screen display. I can all do that within the operating system. So it's really, really nice and a lot more convenient in there. Um, I also do always like to make a point that keep in mind warranty difference. You will find a warranty difference between us and many competitors, namely even like Samsung and LG. Most of the time on their monitors, it's a one-year warranty. Uh, we do offer a longer warranty and we haven't actually openly disclosed actually um, uh, zero bright dot policy, which neither Samsung or LG even have for either one of their monitors. So, so it's not just matching up specifications. I also do think that in terms of the total value proposition, especially with a longer warranty, once you start to break, you know, 300, 400, 500, 800 dollars on a monitor, I like to know that if I'm getting, hey, another year or, or, or three years compared to maybe one year, that to me does also add additional value. Okay. Uh, does the Tough Gaming monitor come with HDMI 2.0? Yes, yeah, HDMI 2.0. Uh, we do have multiple HDMI 2.1 enabled monitors, but you can always check that within the tech spec information if that's something that you're interested in terms of having like, you know, one that supports one specification over the other. Okay. Uh, next up, we've got the ROG Strix. This is going to be another update right here. This is going to be the ROG Strix XG32AQ. Um, I think this is a really, really nice option for a lot of people. Um, I like that it's a bump up to a little bit of a larger display. So instead of 27 inches, it's going to be a uh, 47 inch based monitor, excuse me, a 32 inch based monitor instead of 27 inches, right? So right here, you can see this has a thin bezel, full black, um, of course, stand. And this also supports the ROG desk mount kit. So if you've never seen the ROG desk mount kit, uh, let me go ahead and show you that really quick. But that means that you could add this little accessory and it allows you to have kind of a really cool, clean, stylized desk setup. So if you don't want to have to do like a whole visa mount arm and all that kind of situation, you don't have to do that. You can literally just get this little desk mount kit 
and you can see how you can have this really nice, cool, clean setup, right? And you can still have ergonomic adjustment, right? So this is a simple, easy accessory, and it's compatible with almost all of our ROG monitors. It's one of the value propositions you get in an ROG monitor compared to like a Tough Gaming monitor. Also, Tough Gaming monitors to ROG Strix. ROG Strix monitors have factory calibration for tight color accuracy out of the box, where Tough Gaming can be good, and they can be factory calibrated to very good results, but you have to calibrate it yourself versus like ROG will come already factory calibrated. Um, but 32 inches, 1440p, fast IPS, 175 hertz, one millisecond peak. That's not your overall average, but your peak gray to gray, so still very fast. Um, NVIDIA G-Sync compatible, variable overdrive, which just helps ensure kind of a smoother motion clarity experience across the actual refresh range, and a display HDR 600. Now, while this is not like a full array mini LED type of technology for really impressive HDR, I think the main benefit here is this is a much brighter panel than standard. So again, if most users are coming over from like a monitor of 150 to 250 nits, having a monitor that can easily hit 350, 400, 450 nits, it's a much punchier and more vibrant panel. So so um, I'm a big fan of just having that, even if I'm not gaming and actually HDR, right? Um, so this also does feature, like I said, the revised uh, kind of more broad base design, which gives you more space in terms of your desk. Uh, it does also integrate USB pass-through base support um, for that nice cable rounding option. Of course, all of the display options for things like Game Visual and Game Plus, Shadow Boost, all that stuff. And this one also supports the display widget software, which lets you control um, essentially the OS settings inside of Windows. You don't have to physically use uh, the buttons on the monitor, right? And this one also does have a USB hub on there, two HDMI, and then one DP port, and then also that line level output for either speakers or for headphones that are on there, okay? So that is going to be the XG32AQ, and I uh, didn't put the price on that one, so let me put the price on that one. So give me one second here. And I'll put the price on that. And that one will be 529 and again if you want to go a little bit uh, lower then of course we have 27 inch variants right uh, but i think kind of the 32 is a nice sweet spot addition right there Uh, John says, on the last stream, you mentioned the PA32DC for a great OLED monitor, but I'm looking for something like that except on the gaming line, so ROG side, plus any plans for it, maybe an update to the PG32UQX. That's a very different type of monitor, mini LED to OLED. Um, they're not even kind of similar, right? Um, just because OLED is never going to get anywhere near close to what mini LED can offer in terms of peak brightness. Um, also, then you even talk about micro LED technology, which we're also evaluating. Um, that being said, um, I don't think you need to necessarily kind of quote unquote say that it's not gaming because you have to remember that one of the really big propositions of response time on OLED is so low um, that you don't necessarily need refresh rate in the same way that you do. But if you really wanted high refresh rate, there's right now the only option that we have is the ROG Swift, which is either in 42 or 48 inches. Make sure to keep it tuned. Uh, maybe I'll see stuff in the future. But right now, we don't have anything else beyond the PA32DC under the ROG line. But, you know, as always, make sure to keep it tuned um, in terms if you're looking for something OLED, right, but not the ROG Swift 32, excuse me, uh, 42 or 48 inch, right? Um, and as far as a replacement for the PG32 UQX, we don't have any immediate plans to replace that monitor, but we will have a more aggressively priced full array um, mini LED uh, panel that will probably be coming out towards the very end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, which is that PG32 UQXE, or it may be kind of tweaked in terms of the model name, but there will be a model that be kind of positioned under that for somebody that wants kind of peak brightness, high refresh rate, 4K, HDMI 2.1, kind of those specifications, okay? Lex Luthor, uh, PG32UQXE was canceled. Um, just make sure to keep it tuned. You'll see an announcement. I don't say necessarily canceled. You might see that maybe the name might change, um, but the overall kind of target specification of what we're going to be looking at for that in terms of that monitor, I think is still going to be an active focus for us. So make sure to just keep it tuned in that regard, okay? All right. Um, so let's just quickly recap right here. We went through the 7900 XT, the B650E-I Gaming, our giveaway, our Pro Art. Um, PA147 CDV uh, monitor, uh, the Maximus C790 Apex, um, the XG32AQ monitor, the Tough Gaming VG34 curved monitor, and also the WS680 Ace uh, motherboard. So we've got two last things to go ahead and touch on here quickly. So let's go ahead and 
Let's do the hoodie first. I think the hoodie's kind of cool. So let's, let's go ahead and just do the hoodie. We'll do that instead of the Zen Wi-Fi really quick. Um, so if you guys don't know, we actually have a pretty big, actually, apparel right now that's available. Um, so right now is where we're finally getting into that little bit kind of colder uh, weather. Um, I'm in California, and now it's finally started to kind of get a little bit uh, uh, colder as of late. And so we actually do have some cool stuff in terms of like actually windbreakers and actually um, kind of really kind of robust actually jackets that have a little bit of kind of cool star uh, ROG styling. If you even want something that's kind of fully waterproof and can kind of protect you out there in terms of kind of wind and and rain uh, but you know if you're chilling at home well guess what we've got this guy right here this is going to be the rog cosmic lit hoodie it's pretty cool it's a nice actually cotton and a terry blend so it's nice and soft it's got a nice level of warmth to it um, it's got some nice actually attention to detail right here too where actually this is what's called an enlarged actually um, headspace and so this is actually so even if you want to kind of have your headphones on um, some actually kind of hooded sweatshirts are a little bit tight so you kind of can't still fit anything on there if you put your um uh, your the, the hood over um, you still actually have space for me personally also I'm a little bit bigger person I like having a little bit of open space even if I don't have headphones on there I do also like that we have actually drawstrings on there to go ahead and a little bit more easily account for how much this is cinched in or tightened up just for kind of fit and for comfort um, plus also when you wash it it makes sure to if you've ever had actually the string get lost on the inside and then you got to kind of pull it back out and then you end up having a, a sweatshirt that doesn't have the drawstring anymore that becomes a bummer so it's actually um, all in there it's all nicely kind of maintained nice of course pockets right there and the reason why it's called the cosmic lick hoodie is because um, this right here is glow-in-the-dark so it's got a cool little kind of design aesthetic to it there um, again nice comfortable chill really cool uh, this is gonna be coming in at I believe 70 bucks it is gonna be available and if you haven't actually tried out some of our clothing, I think you'll definitely find that the construction quality, the fit and the finish of the apparel is quite nice. Um, we really do use uh, better quality materials and construction, I think compared to a lot of products that are out there on the market. So it's not something that generally is gonna be kind of very entry in that regard. Um, we do also, like I said, have some other cool things like here, we've got the ROG Space Windbreaker, uh, which is kind of a little bit lighter shell, right? Which is gonna be pretty cool. Um, this one's a little bit lighter. This is a full poly design. It's a little bit lighter weight. Um, and it's a nice kind of just little throw it over maybe your your kind of t-shirt and things along those lines uh, If you're looking for something like that and then if you want something a little bit more robust um, I think the asymmetry. Let me see if we have it over here. It should probably be over here Let me go ahead and turn it right here. Yeah, the a series and a rock jacket right here. This is very serious uh, unit right here. This is actually a three layer what's called laminated construction. So laminated really means that the membrane material doesn't allow for actually water to ingress. So you could really actually feel really confident that if you're going to go out there and even if it's raining, it's snowing, really heavy amount of actually wind. So wind force and wind chill can really kind of get through you. Um, you don't really have to worry about that. This is going to keep you nice and warm, cool. Um, and there's also some nice kind of cool little aesthetics right here where you can see the design again cinched in construction some nice little RG accents right there uh, pockets right here this is kind of cool where you can go ahead and keep things on the inside have it easily accessible to you You can open it up you know maybe pull out your wallet pull out your phone pull out little things in there pen whatever you want to keep in there right but you don't have to worry about kind of losing it just kind of cinch it back up and you're good to go right that nice little reflective policy right there and then of course there's a little cinch in right there so overall pretty cool uh, if you guys are interested, check it out. Um, so cool stuff. And again, um, this one definitely, I think, designed for this time of the year. Okay. So that's going to take care of that. Let me quickly see if we got any quick questions right there. A show of computers it says, dig it, winter is coming right there. <laughs> Sniff, right? He's saying, ooh, need it for the Canada. Low temps. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm spoiled. I'm in California. And, you know, we, we get a little bit of wind chill right here. And I get winds in our section. Uh, but I don't have to deal with snow. So I'm thankful that I don't have to deal with snow. I don't know how you guys do it in that regard, right? Um, okay. Um, so lastly, let's go ahead and just wrap it up. We've got one more uh, product right here, and then we will jump into the PC Dial Builder Spotlight, see how many I can get done, because I do got to pretty much make sure to end on time today. So let's go ahead and get into our last product right here. Uh, where is it going to be? This is going to be the Zen Wi-Fi XD5, um, and let me actually double check price point on this one. I think it's going to be, I 
think this is gonna be two ninety nine. Oh, you know, I haven't even talked about the ROG. Excuse me, the RT AXC seventy eight hundred. So actually, I've got two more products right here. So sorry about that, guys. I, I will bang these out pretty quickly right here. Um, but this is going to be the Zen Wi-Fi XD5. So this will be a three pack. This will actually be part of our Zen Wi-Fi line. So if you're not aware, we've got like our Asus classic routers, which are essentially routers. They usually have a lot more ports on them in terms of LAN ports. Generally have higher performing chipsets. Um, they're usually also going to have the most kind of robust type of kind of features and functions. Um, mesh solutions generally might have a little bit lower performing based chipsets, although not all of them, because we have some very, very high performing chipset chipsets. And we also have ones that are tri-band and even quad-band based uh, designs. And also support multi-gig networking but generally mesh kind of focused a little bit more kind of at streamlined kind of just coverage not necessarily always speed and the main reason being is if you don't understand kind of the difference is that with mesh if you have let's say like a dual band router or like a tri-band router right you're going to use always one of the bands to connect essentially these different nodes together so if this is 2.5 and 5 gigahertz take for instance you might have the 5 gigahertz connection connect this node to this node to this node. That means you only have one band open. If you have a traditional router, traditional router will always give you all your bands. So if you have a dual band router, you get both bands. If you get a tri-band router, you get all three bands. If you have a quad band router, you get all bands, all four of those. In a mesh networking, you're always going to lose one of the bands to what's called the backhaul. The only way that you don't lose a backhaul is if you use a wired backhaul, which we do fully support. It means if you wanna run a cable from this unit to this unit to this unit, and then have them provide a wireless signal, then you could have both bands be available to you for the best wireless speed, okay? But this will be a dual band unit. It will support coverage all the way up to 5,000 square feet, if not even a bit more. Uh, easily supports, you know, 20, 30, 40 base devices. There's no problem. Um, it has multiple LAN ports on there, although it doesn't have multi-gig LAN. So if you're somebody that may be looking to upgrade to like 2.5 gig based ISP service in the future, that might be something you want to keep, about, keep in mind. Although we do support... Um, uh, dual WAN and LAN aggregation on these models. So we do have that as a flexible point for you, okay? And of course, all of these units do come with our Asus AI protection technology, which will help to, once you enable it, helps to block you from any type of malicious websites, which if you're a smart and sensible user when it comes online, great for you. But if you've got friends and family, um, maybe if they're clicking on the wrong links, spam, instant messages, this helps to prevent them from ever connecting to a malicious server because it's automatically blocked on the router level. And you don't pay for this, unlike some other companies which will charge you kind of some type of fee or subscription cost. This is included in the cost of the router and it continually gets updated in terms of what's called a filtering engine that will filter malicious websites and servers. And uh, we have really, really great options that are built in the Asus router app as well as on the web-based interface. So you can control this and set it up however you want. It's really up to you in terms of how you um, set everything up. And there's tons of kind of more features, functions, and specifications that we have available. Um, and if you're interested, um, check out actually our stream that we had uh, a while back ago that talks about upgrading to Wi-Fi 6 and 2.5 gig networking if that's something that you're interested in, okay? Um, the one other model that I want to go ahead and touch on here, do I have it in here? Hopefully I have it in here. Wait one second. <clears throat> All right. Um, do, do, do. Okay, let me go ahead and just bring this one up here. Give me one second. This model to me might be maybe one of the most exciting models that we've come out with in a long time. And the reason why is because traditionally to be able to access Wi-Fi 6E, as well as also accessing uh, tri-band has been actually quite expensive. It's not been something that was generally gonna be low cost. Um, you're usually looking at upwards of $500. This unit will be coming at 329, so it's pretty much just about the cheapest you can get in this regard. But if you're looking to be able to upgrade finally to Wi-Fi 6E, remember, all of our laptops come with Wi-Fi 6E, our latest phones come with Wi-Fi 6E, our latest motherboards, even mini PCs are coming with Wi-Fi 6E. Um, this is really cool in terms of having this feature. Also, this unit does support 2.5 gigabit, um, which it's really cool. 2.5 gigabit, of course, is for the next generation of ISP services. So most people don't necessarily have a one gigabit based connection, but with 2.5 gigabit, of course, that's gonna be even faster. So this unit already does have 2.5 gigabit WAN support. And you're also going to have um, 
flexibility for things like dual WAN, WAN aggregation is also going to be present on there, um, and also the higher performing tri-band. So you're going to have three bands that are available. So even if you want to put two of these together and you want to use one of the bands to connect one and then another one together, you would still have two bands available. That's one of the really big strengths of a tri-band router versus a dual band router. So from a mesh configuration standpoint, tri-band routers are significantly faster than dual band routers for mesh. So even if you don't use it, in the wired configuration and you use it purely in the wireless configuration for the future, um, it's quite high performance. This also features a very high performing uh, quad core based chipset. So it's a 1.7 gigahertz quad core based processor, 512 megabytes of RAM there for very, very high performance. And uh, you've got tons of really advanced features. This unit supports on uh, router VPN functionality. So if you want a thing that runs like OpenVPN or if you want to run WireGuard, um, all of that can be run directly on the router. You have on the fly quality of service so you can automatically adjust this for uh, streaming for gaming for uh, you know for um, working from home applications um, all those things can be done within the asus router app live on the fly so you can go ahead and toggle optimizing either a specific device or a specific type of experience so uh, definitely i think this is one of the best options if you're looking to kind of jump up and not go super super expensive um, really going to be hard to beat i think in terms of price to performance to range really kind of all the features and really giving you kind of the latest generation again with 2.5 gigabit wan support wi-fi 6e based support and tri-band, um, probably in my overall kind of go-to model, I think in that high-end recommendation segment. If you're looking for something a little bit below, then still my recommendations like the RT-AX86 or the RT-AX82 um, are very good options that would drop you about $100 and then about another $100 uh, approximately, okay? All right, so that takes care of that. Um, I just see right here. Uh, PGPCs, I really like the look of this router. Yeah, I think it's a uh, very cool. It's not under a gaming lineup, so it doesn't look kind of gamer centric, right? Um, but you know, it's pretty cool. Um, the last one that I'm gonna go ahead and just touch on right here, guys, is um, I did already note this in the group. Um, I don't have a full update, but I just wanted to guys let you know that uh, we do have it coming. Um, and I did give this in an update in all the PSUs that are coming, but this is gonna be here, the full image for the ROG Strix Aura edition based power supply. So this is going to be the follow-up to the current RG Strix power supplies. So the current RG Strix power supplies, they're really, really, really nice. They're fully modular. They're gold certified, have enlarged heatsink designs. But this is the next generation, which feature even a revised advanced topology, um, higher performing, uh, full ATX 3.0 certified, which means that, of course, you're going to have the native 16 pin cable support on here. These also are going to integrate this cool little ARGB lighting design aesthetic, kind of like the Thor lighting, which has uh, ARGB lighting, uh, aluminum shell and frame, 135 millimeter axial tech based fan. Of course, large robust VRM heat sinks that are going to be in this model. And this will come in 750 watt, 850 watt, 1000 watt, and 1200 watt. So pretty much will cover like the entire range of what most builders are going to be looking for when it comes to power supply configurations, um, you know, from the majority of builds. Okay. All right, so I think that takes care of that. Very cool. All right, so um, I think now let's go to see how much I can squeeze in here. Maybe I can fit two or three in here in terms of the PCDI Web Builder Spotlight, guys. So let's go ahead and get ready to jump into it here. So let me go ahead and load up the names here. here. And again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to go ahead and uh, let me know. Uh, let me go ahead and just open up our PCDIY Builder Spotlight submission form. And if, guys, if you guys are not familiar uh, with the PCDIY Builder Spotlight, um, essentially you can go ahead and submit your system to be featured here on the stream, right? Um, it's a great way to be able to showcase your, your builds, right, to a lot of people out in their community. And we can also sometimes feature it in our ASUS social media channels. So let me go ahead and uh, see here. Our first build, I think, is going to be... I think it's the Master Chief build by Pause Hardware, if I remember correctly. Give me one second right here. Okay, here, yep, here we go. Okay, yep, so that's gonna be this guy. So let's go ahead and put that in there. Master Chief. It's actually not exactly the name. Oh, 
All right, let's go ahead and take a look here at this build. All right, what do we got going on here? Uh, this looks like a rear shot here. Okay, we can already see we got some nice custom cables. We're getting a little bit of green, getting some purples. I'm already really liking the color scheme. Oh, there we go. We immediately got serious right here. <laughs> um, very, very cool. So right off the bat, we can go ahead and already see uh, the theme at play here. So if you're a fan, of course, of the Halo universe, you're a fan of Master Chief, uh, which I definitely am, um, you've got a really cool design aesthetic. I already love the finishing that we've got right here on this front facade. Really kind of just immediately gives you that strong um, kind of identifiable uh, color scheme and, of course, theme uh, to let us know kind of that we're going to be jumping into something that's Halo derived, right? I love the cautionary kind of yellow and black right here. Even the actual button is pretty slick and how it ties in. It almost feels like it's kind of part of this overall kind of look and feel. And then, of course, we can definitely see that we've got a lot going on right here where we've got a vertically oriented graphics card. We've got these really nice premium combs. Uh, we can definitely see we've got some hard line right there also. So it's giving us this little bit of a tease to know what we've got going on when we take a look here at this system, right? And pulling out, pulling out all the way back, right, we can start to see that this was the shot that we saw where we can see this is, of course, the distro. We're showing off the cables, which I think the cables, of course, they're one, they're very nicely and cleanly routed. But of course, you've got a little bit of this kind of aesthetic that I think actually gives a little bit of kind of this biomech kind of feel to it, which I think feels kind of in line with kind of the Spartan feel and the vibe of what we've got going on. I really like, of course, uh, this attention to detail right here, which really speaks to kind of the simmer type of kind of... Um, machinery and kind of finishing that you would see, I think, within kind of the Halo uh, universe. So I think that works well. Color scheme is just a fantastic. And there we go. Now we can actually take a look and see what we've got going on here in the system. So um, really, really cool. Really, really like this layout, like this use of space. Here's just a little bit of kind of like some nice filigree, some little kind of just attention to detail. Um, You've got the radiator right here, three fans. You've got this integrated distro. I really love the choice here to take it to the next level. Going, going at it looks like these are probably countersunk screws. I really like countersunk screws in my personal builds. I use them. I think it just adds a nice attention to detail to give you a color contrast to just having like a silver or like a, a black screw. Um, so that's pretty cool right there. Um, I almost feel like I wish I could have seen the Dim.2 card in there. I think that would have been kind of cool to maybe even customize it a little bit, but I think it looks great. Um, anyways, we can see right here, we've got the glacial board. Glacial board looking fantastic. Of course, it solidifies this really clean design aesthetic because it's a full block that goes from the top of the motherboard all the way down. You lose a little bit of that design aesthetic, but then you're showing off, of course, the block here on the graphics card in this vertical orientation. And I like the kind of the waterfall effect. I think it actually creates a little bit of a contiguous look and feel. So I'm really digging that. That looks really, really nice. And of course, the color scheme is on point with the black, the green, and then you've got a little bit of kind of this almost like um, orangey kind of gold accent, which I think looks really, really nice, right? Um, overall, really cool. And I think even here, the Capellic sliding for the dims probably are the good choice. I think these go with a little bit more of like a rigid kind of feel to them, which kind of align with the kind of Spartan look and feel. Going with the black tubing, I think looks fantastic. I really love these nice bends right here, just smooth, clean bends doing a nice little uh, job right there. A little bit of a bummer, I think, to lose out on the um, anime matrix. I think that that could have been maybe customized with the pixel editor. You could have gone with individual colors. So maybe actually had those been green, right? Um, or you could have had maybe a different color there to kind of tie into the theme. Um, you could have even had maybe Halo or kind of had Master Chief or something like that there, or even taken this pattern and put that into the anime matrix. So this is a stunning build, but I feel like the anime matrix you know, could have helped evolve that or maybe actually taken, you know, Cortana, put Cortana in there. You know, I think there could have been some kind of interesting things to play around with that. So I think that's just a little bit of a loss on that side. But otherwise, love the overall, the fit and finish. It looks really, really good in terms of the overall design aesthetic. Um, yeah. That's probably my only little niggle right there that I would probably say, but absolutely stunning build. Attention to detail and the execution is on point. I would expect nothing less uh, from uh, Pause Hardware and, of course, uh, their builder, right? I mean, it's just a great, great looking theme, great looking build, clean fit and finish and execution, and the theme is on point, right? So let's go ahead and bring up the uh, submission form right here and see what we actually got going on. So 
Uh, give me one second here to bring up the submission form. Uh, da -da. Okay, here we go. Yep. Yeah. All right. Mm, sorry, guys. Let me just save that really quick there. Okay, here we go. That's it. Okay, so we've got the submission form right here. And we're going to bring our system back up here. All right, there we go. We'll leave it on that. I think that works. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, let's leave it on that one. I think that's a pretty, pretty good image right there. Or, hmm. Yeah, I think that's okay right there. All right, so let's see here. Um, the build was a sponsored build. Does the build have a, a theme? Halo Master Chief. <laughs> Few words to describe the build. Badass. Um, I definitely agree. I think this is a pretty awesome build. Um, does the build have a name? Spectre 3.0 Master Chief. Um, let's see. So this is going to be uh, Spectre 3.0. Um, from Singularity Computers, yep, uh, it's uh, featuring a 12900KS, this is going to be on the prior generation, uh, well, on the Z690, so yes, on the prior generation uh, chipset, but the Z690 Extreme Glacial, um, then we have an RTX 3080, which is, of course, also water-cooled, we've got a DDR5 from Corsair, then we have an HX1000 Corsair power supply, um, cables are from Cub Cable Mods, of course, customized, then we have a Fantex uh, riser, uh, that's also in there, PCI Gen 4, and then the water cooling uh, supplemental items are going to be from Alpha Cool. Overall total budget for this was about $8,000. They were most proud of the modding parts, which you can see tons of customization right here in terms of all these little modding accents, these little pieces, right, which, you know, you're adding the, the color, you're adding the finishing, you're adding all that little filigree and attention to detail. I definitely would agree. I mean, that's what really sets off the build. Otherwise, it would look as a really cool, just high-end water-cooled build, but that's what really takes the theme and the look and the feel to the next level right is there anything that they would change about it um, maybe try to see if they could upgrade to a 4090 um, how long did it take to build the system about two months in terms of the overall time is generally used for gaming so tarkov overwatch 2 uh, battlefield uh, the overall favorite aspect of this system is the glacial it's a stunning motherboard um, just you know overall the features functions the performance and the aesthetics of it is fantastic I would definitely agree. Uh, man, serious thumbs up. It's a fantastic build, and thank you so much for submitting it. Really, really awesome, right? Um, so pretty, pretty cool. Let's see. Uh, thumbs up right here. We got thumbs up on this build. Suman says, nice build. They got the same case. Wow, there you go, right? Um, HGL Computers nailed it. Yeah, they said that's a, a Singularity chassis, right? Correct. PGPCs is saying, wow, and Michael is throwing it up right there saying, love the front panel, right? Um, hey, Mark Connors, your overclock guide on Z790, awesome. Got 6.1 on three cores and 5.8 on the rest, so all fun, all ROG build. Man, thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I'm going to actually be having even a little bit of follow-up guide to do a little bit of kind of more um, just tuning guidance and recommendation, but definitely I think the one that we've got ahead and, and broken now right there, I'll have a short form one, kind of like a follow-up to the 12th gen one, but specifically for 13th gen. But yeah, man, Asus AOC and that tuning guide, um, fantastic stuff. I think it's really, really great way to be able to get more out of your system, right? All right, let's quickly see if we can maybe squeeze one or two more in here, guys, before I wrap things up here. Uh, we've got Zero Fighter in here. So let's go ahead and bring this one up in here. Let's see what we got going on here. This is going to be Zero Fighter. Let me go ahead and um, get the name. So this is going to be from... This is going to be Cro Crow's Bars? I'm hoping I'm saying this right. Oh, okay. Let's go ahead and... Um, Augustus, Augustus, I don't know if I'm saying that right, man. I'm apologize if I'm not. Um, but let me go ahead and get you in here, right? And this is going to be Zero Fighter. So let's go ahead and take a look at Zero Fighter here. All right, let's go ahead and see what we got going on here. So here we got a little bit of everything. All right, so we've got, uh, of course, our hardware that we can see. We've already got, uh, oh, this looks like, is this an Apex? Okay, we got some Landly fans, some Corsair hardware. We've got a Ryogen 360. All right, let's see. Oh, oh, there we go already. Um, so we can see right there. Yeah, we've got an Apex 210 board in there. We got some G-Skin Royal base memory in there. Got the Ryogen, nice mounted in, really clean. This is my favorite orientation for the Ryogen. Um, looks really nice, clean, well executed. You can see you've got a Founders Edition base graphics card in there. 
right there. About the only thing, of course, you could say is, hey, maybe getting a custom cable just to clean that up just a smidge right there. But overall cable management, the routing, everything is clean. It's on point, nice and uh, very well routed in terms of all your cable routing. And of course, those Landly Unifans, once they come on and engaged, are going to look good. And there we go. Got it lit up. Uh, I love the design aesthetic for the Apex, this slash that it has. It's one of my favorite designs where it's just got this RGB kind of just a little bit of aggressive lighting scheme right here. And then it rolls down to the bottom. This is one of the reasons why I prefer kind of a horizontal orientation to see a little bit of depth and contrast. Um, that nice just kind of clean silhouette there from the FE card. And then, of course, the nice lighting design there that you have present on the uni fans. And of course, they're nice and clean because they integrate in terms of a daisy chain based design. Uh, there's really nothing to gate on here, right? About the only thing would, like I said, be going with a custom cable just to go ahead and clean that up. That would probably be my only kind of point right there. You could argue that getting a custom cable right here would keep it clean, but I think this is already really clean and really nice, so I don't see any point to change it. I think the only cable that I would customize would probably be for the graphics card, just to go ahead and have that be a little bit cleaned up. Um, I like this chassis though. It's nice mesh-based intake design, so clean and well laid out right there. And there you've got your nice gaming setup right there. Uh, start to finish, clean, well set up, nice lighting scheme. Um, and of course, that Ryogen out there, um, just kind of taking a little bit further. And I love the little Hulk right there. That's that's pretty slick right there, too. So very cool build, man. Uh, gets my definite thumbs up. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look and see here what we got on our submission form. So give me one second. Let's go ahead and bring that up really quick. And let me go ahead and... Leave it on this one. I think that's a good little shot right there. I wish we had one that was a little bit kind of more side profile, but we you know we work with what we've got right here. Um, so does the build have a theme? There was no theme. Uh, three words to describe the build, uh, just beast. You just put beast. Um, it's definitely a high performance system with an Apex and with a graphics card in there. You definitely are not talking about a slow system. This is a, a high end performance oriented system. So this is gonna be a Core i9 11900K. I'm assuming you got a nice overclock going on there with either Asus AIFC or manually tuning it yourself. Um, then you've got, of course, that uh, Maximus 13 Apex. Um, then you've got um, some nice Trident Royal Z, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, Trident Royals in there. Uh, 4266 C16 base memory. You got two options right there. You could either run, uh, you know, a, a tighter timing kind of configuration or that, but that's a nice balance between frequency and timings. Um, you've got Samsung uh, two, yeah, two PCIe NVMe SSDs in there, one 500 gigabyte and one terabyte, a Ryogen 2360, which he swapped out the fans to the uni fans. He's got 10 uni fans that are in the SL120s, then a 3090 uh, in there, and then a 1000 watt power supply, and then of course the 5000D. Uh, he was trying to ultimately not break about a $3,000 budget, which he was able to more or less hit. What was he most proud of is the overall the looks. Um, it's humble while the lights are off, and then simple, clean, and all about performance. And I definitely would agree with that. It's just simple, clean, well laid out, and it's a system that's designed to be stable, reliable, and high performing. And that's definitely kind of actually my kind of build. That's literally something I would probably put together. I don't know if I would have done Unifans, um, but uh, overall, definitely kind of that simple, clean focus aesthetic. I'm a big fan of it, and you definitely nailed it. It looks really nicely done. Is there anything you would change about the build? Um, of course, going to maybe the latest generation, Apex with then like a 13900K, uh, that would be pretty cool, but it would also change up a little bit of the aesthetic because of course you'd be going to a whiteboard. Um, took him about five months to be able to get everything together. I'm assuming that's not only the parts, but also maybe getting together the budget to be able to um, put everything together. Um, it's pretty much used for article writing, for Adobe InDesign, for Photoshop, some light video editing, and then Call of Duty multiplayer, including Warzone. Um, his overall feature, feature and kind of function, he's a big fan of actually Armory Crate to be able to monitor his system, be able to tweak and tune it, as well as, of course, to be able to customize the RGB lighting profile. He's a big fan of the Asus ROG UEFI experience um, and overall really easy to work with, man. Fantastic build, man. Did a great job. Thanks for submitting it and uh, best luck with your build, man. And thanks for being Team ROG and Team Maximus. Hey, fantastic. Thanks for catching us live, man. Happy to have you here. So thanks so much for joining us. Pidgey PC says it gives it a very clean build. Um, we get looks great and nice build uh, overall. Yeah, very, very cool. All right. Uh, yeah, H2 Computers, I'm wondering maybe about that prior build, right? He says that maybe the Dim.2 add-in card got in the way of the, uh, the tube run. It's a possibility, right? It depends on how much kind of clearance you have right there, right? 
All right, um, so I think that overall wraps it up, guys. I was hoping to get a third one in there, but I just got to end up actually going over to a meeting that I've got to wrap up at five. So I'm going to be wrapping that up, guys. So overall, if you guys have any other questions or comments or feedback, feel free to go ahead and join us in the ASUS PC DIY group. Um, go ahead and drop us your questions, comments, feedback, whatever it might be, and I'll do my best to go ahead and get back to you guys when I can. We've got an amazing community, almost 40,000 members right there of fellow passionate PC DIY enthusiasts. So if you're going to be building your system, upgrading it, tweaking your tuning or just enjoying some gaming uh, have a fantastic friday night enjoy your weekend stay safe stay healthy best of luck with your builds and your upgrades and make sure to go ahead and check us out in the group till next week guys take care take care and enjoy your weekends uh, i did already go over the bios updates make sure to go ahead and check out the very beginning of the stream just click all the way back to the beginning and we'll run you down on all those uefi bios updates take care